So we're still on the topic of arrays, and assignment three involves a multi-dimensional array. If I call it a two-dimensional array, then you can't find the word two-dimensional array in the textbook. So look it up under multi-dimensional array. I think it's like page 409, something like that. No, that can't be right. Anyways, you can, you can look in the index and you'll find the two-dimensional arrays. So we had an assignment existing here. But this is actually not the one that I wanted to use. I'm pre going to present an alternate assignment so you can pick which one you want to use. Here's the assignment as it was. The objective of this lab session is to understand two-dimensional arrays and using the java.util.array class. So at the end, we will display a 40 by 40 array of numbers in a grid format. Randomly selected positions in the array will contain non-zero values, randomly generated between 1 and 9, and the rest of the elements will contain the default value of 0. The values will initially be stored in an array list before being placed in a two-dimensional array, and we will make 40 randomly valued sets of coordinates to add to the array list. So the way that would look is that when we want the program to be done, we want it to display a 40 by 40 series of numbers like this and if the number was randomly selected if the spot was randomly selected it would have a value there and if it did not then it would have no value there so to do this we would probably want to have a point class which had X Y and Z integer members and then we would make an array list of the point class and we fill, would fill them up with random numbers. Then we would make a two-dimensional array and using the array list we would copy those values into the two-dimensional array so we could display it. So let's think about just a few parts of that. Let's go into NetBeans. I thought I had it open. And so just playing around with it, we know we're going to want a map, which is a two-dimensional array. And how do you declare a two-dimensional? Two well, you give the data type. That's how you declare a one-dimensional array. To declare a two-dimensional array, you add a second pair of braces. And then you allocate it. So it's not new map, new int. And you give it a size. 40 by 40 in the assignment. In this example, I'm going to give 10 by 10. And so if we want to print that out, we need a nested loop. Right now, it's just got zeros in it. It's not very impressive. But we can go ahead and print it out anyways. For int x is equal to 0, or let's call them row and column. Row is equal to 0. Row is less than the size of the map. Map dot length row plus plus. Now we need an inner loop. This is going to count through the outer elements. So it'll count, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 in the row space. Nobody can see where I'm pointing if I'm pointing at screen. We will be counting 0 through 9 here. And then we the inner loop will be counting 0 through 9 here. So we need an inner loop for enter column is equal to zero. Column is less than map dot length. Column plus plus. Now we can actually print our value out. And I'm going to use a printf so that I can force it to be a specific length, specific width. Not necessary in this assignment, but for the next assignment we're going to talk about, it could be useful. I'm going to say percent %2D because I want every cell on here to consist of two digits. I could just put percent %D, but we're going to give each one two spaces wide. But we're not going to use print line 
we don't want to print a carriage return until we've done the interleave because we're going to print one number, then the next number, then the next number, and then the next number, and then the next number, and then finally we're going to hit return on our typewriter. So the inner loop is going to print across the row, and then at the end it's going to have a print line. This doesn't show the data that we're printing out, though, so let's get the data out of it. Int data is equal to our map at specific row column. messing up. Print F. Alrighty, there we go. Print F. Okay. System dot out dot print line. Just to get a carriage return at the end of it. So this is going to print out a 10 by 10 grid of numbers. But they're all going to be zeros because we didn't put any data into it. There we go. So we could get fancier. The map assignment doesn't require it to be fancier, but we could do this. System.out.println row followed by the row number. But let's just make it a print rather than a print line. Or we'll make it a printf. I can't help but use printfs. Okay. Row percent 2D. That'll give us two spaces for the row number. And that'll start off our row. That'll be the first thing that's in the row. And then the row will consist of a series of 10 numbers. And then we'll print a character turn. And then we'll come back and we'll repeat that for row 1 and row 2 and so on. Like that. So that is how you display a two-dimensional array. Now this two-dimensional array is incredibly boring because all it is is zeros. But we can assign values into it. Like, let's say that we want coordinates, this coordinate right here, here, to have the number 10 in it. Well, let's see. This is at row 2, and it's a column. You have to start counting at 0. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So it's at position 2, 9. So here we will give that map to 9 is going to equal 10. So now when we run it, that one should change. And it has changed. I don't like it filling up all that space like that, so I'm going to change it to a 9 rather than a 10, but there we go. So let's change that one. What are his coordinates going to be? Well, we still start counting at 0. 0, 1, 2, 3. And then, what is what column is he in? Yeah, he's in column 2 because that's 0, 1, 2. So row 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, column 1, 2. What number are we going to put there? I don't know. Let's put a 6. I've already forgotten. What did I say that was? 3 and then 2. All right. Okay, so that assignment would involve constructing an array like this, except 40 by 40, and at randomly generated numbers, we're going to fill in randomly generated values. So like the random number generator might say, okay, at position 4 or 5, I want you to stick a 3. And then we put a, you know, a 3 at position 4 or 5. But the assignment wanted us to do this in a different way. It wanted us to create a point class and then use that point class in an array list. So let's show a little bit of that. Now the class should go in its own file, but just for ease of demonstration here, I'm going to go ahead and put the class here. And what does the point have? The point has a x, a y, and a z.
if we were going to use an array list of that, let's uh, push this map stuff way down at the bottom. We have this point class. We're going to make an array list of points. Array list of points, and I'm going to call it point list is equal to new array list. It doesn't know what an array list is, so I should go add an import. I'm going to cheat and let NetBeans add the import for me. Add import for java.util.arraylist. Now I need to make some points to add to it. So let's see. Point P is equal to new point. The points.x value is going to be, well, what values did we use down here? Let's recreate this data right here. These are what I want my two values to be in the map eventually. So the point x is going to be 2, the points y is going to be 9, and the points z, the data that it's carrying, is going to be 9. And let's add that to our point list. Point list dot add. That appends it to the array list. And we've just added that point to it. Now let's make a new point. P is equal to new point. We will re need to add those values again. Now this is pretty ugly. I think I would like to add a constructor to this class so that it was easier to use, but okay. So what should X be for this second point? Because this we're working on this one now. So we're going to, s yeah, thank you. So now if we want to add the second point to our array list, what would the x value of that point need to be? Mm -hmm. x value would be 3. The y value will be 9. Um, no, 2. See here? 9. Totally wrong. OK, 2. And the z value of it will be 6. So the assignment wants these to be randomly generated. And it wants 40 of them being randomly generated. But we're just hard coding everything for now. And we will add that to our point list as well. Point list dot add. Now we could print those things out if we wanted to with a, with a for each loop. For each loop would be appropriate. For each point. in the point list system dot out dot print f percent two d percent two d percent two d just two spaces for each digit and we will print out the points x value the points y value and the point z value this is just to make sure that what's in our array list is what we expect And then it's immediately going to run and do all this other stuff. So for now, I'm going to comment out the rest of this other stuff. So I run it. And since I forgot to put a slash in at the end of my printf, it looks lousy. There we go. At coordinates 2, 9, 9, we want to store 9. And at coordinates 3, 2, we want to store 6. So that's our data in the point list. We want to create 40 such points, and we want the, the values to be randomly assigned. And I'm pretty sure that there's a hint document that shows how to make random numbers. So to fill up our map with those values, let's recreate our map array. It's going to be a 40 by 40 array. No, a 10 by 10 array. It doesn't matter what size it is is equal to new int that declares our 10 by 10 array. And then we need another for loop that's going to run through the point list. For every point, 
and the point list. Let's get our x, y, and z values out of it, and or our row. Int row is equal to the point dot x. Int column is equal to the point dot y. And int the data at that element is equal to point dot z. And then it's real easy to plug that into the map. Map at row. Column is equal to that data element. And now we need a for loop to print our array out. May as well write that again. This one's going to be a little bit simpler. Print i is equal to, no, for row is equal to zero. Row is less than the length of the map. And by the way, I had a mistake in the other for loop. I'm surprised it worked. We'll, we will correct that. Then the inner loop needs to be for int column is equal to 0. But the limit of it is not the length of the map itself, which is 10. It needs to be the length of the row that we are currently in. So we will do maps row length. That's what the inner loop needs to look like. So in my sample code down here, I goof that up. My outer row was correct because it goes to map length, but my inner row needs to go to maps at that specific row because a two-dimensional array is really just an array of arrays. It's an array of 10 arrays. yelling me something about this. Oh, column is less than. Okay. So then we will system.out.print the data at that element, map. A blank, well, we'll print a character term. So now when we run it, here's what our data look like. At coordinate 2, 9, there should be a 9. Row 1, 2, element 9, there is. And at element 3, 2, there should be a 6. 1, 2, excuse me, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, there it is. And so however many different points we inserted into our point list, this code would copy them over. So let's put some uh, comments here. Create a point to add to the list. And then create another point to add to the list. Note, create a new point each time you add. Don't just change the values. Iterate through the point list, printing the data, just for our sake. Create our map. Iterate through the point list, copying the data from the points and placing the Z value into the map. So the points X value is the row, the points Y value is the column, and the points Z value is the data to be inserted at that element. So that code does. And 
then display our map. If we wanted to get all cool, we could check to see if it was a zero value. And if it was a zero value, just print a dot rather than a zero. So let's do that. Let's get the data out, and we're going to say that the data is the element at map row, comma, column. And I'm just getting it out first because it's easier to keep referring to it by a variable name. And if the data is equal to zero, then we want to print a dot. Else, we want to print. actual data. And I think that's cool myself. We could work at making it purtier by putting, you know, space in there and stuff like that, but okay, that's the last change I'm making to it, I promise. There we go, like that. Nicely spaced out. So we've shown two different ways of printing them. They're really the same way though. We have an outer loop that counts the rows. The inner loop counts the number of columns in that row. This one just added the nicety of saying row number in front of it. And we could really do that in our map too if we wanted to. We could come up here and put that there so that in the inner loop, that's not where that goes. It goes before the inner loop because we only want to print that one time per row. Yeah. All right, do I like it saying row zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? I don't know. I think I'm going to actually remove that, but that would be useful for the alternate assignment. I'm going to get rid of that. All righty, so this is actually the vast majority of assignment three right here. So if I publish this code, then you could just take it and copy it and do assignment three. I don't know if I want to do that or if I just want to make people watch the video. Let's eyeball it one more time. Here's our point class. All it is is sim three simple ints. And then in our main, we created an array list of points. And then we created a new point. We assigned the x, y, and the z values of that point and then added that to our point list. Then we created another point. We would want to do that 40 times with randomly generated numbers for x, y, and z. Here's a for each loop for going through that point list. Here's how we create our two dimensional array. Here's how we iterate through the point list again with a for each loop, getting the x, y, and z values out so that we can use them as our rows, our columns, and our datas, and then assigning that specified element with the specified data. And then lastly, a nested for loop for printing out. All right, if somebody wanted to type all this in from the video, they can do that, but I'm not gonna upload the, uh, the sample code. Right, this one needs a random number generator.
here is one example random number generator, but there are so many different ways of doing it. This is a random number generator class which you could add to your project. And the way it works is like this. Here's your for loop. I want to make a hundred random dots. My x dot is a random number between 0 and 9. My y dot is a random number between 0 and 9. And my z dot is a random number between 0 and 9. But really for this assignment, since we're, the map's supposed to be 40 by 40, mm -hmm. the random numbers should be between 0 and 39. 0 and 39. But the data we still want between 0 and 9. Or actually we want them between 1 and 9. Right, because if it's zero, we won't be able to tell the difference between uninitialized data and that. So if you want to use that class, you can. Or you can just Google up random numbers or find it in the book, and there's other ways. This, but this class was meant to make it easy to use. I don't know if it does or not. The way you do it is if you have that class, since these elements are defined as static, you don't even have to create a random number object in order to use it. Static elements you just invoke. They're, they are class methods. So with that class in your project, then you call random gen dot set seed, and this number initializes the random number generator. And if you leave that number the same, it'll generate the, seri the same series of random numbers over and over and over, which is good for testing purposes. But then if you don't like that, you could initialize it with a more random value like the current time or something like that. But for something like this, just pick a seed value and stick with it and you'll see the same numbers over and over and that's okay. But that wouldn't be much fun in a dice game, for example, if it rolled the same numbers every time. So once you have your seed set, then each time you want a new int, you just call that. Good. I was worried I'd paused it. So the help document for it is here, but it needs some revisions. It mentions something called a class called pair. I should change that to point. So it needs a class called point with an x, y, and a z value, and we actually just demonstrated that. And the random will create point objects assigning random values to the members. The x and the y members will be random between 0 and 39. The z member of the point will be a value between one and nine. Then the program will add each pair to the array list of pair objects. Then with the for loop or for each loop, the program will go through the array list of pairs and increment a 2D array at the XY position specified at that pair. Then we need to print the 2D array. So we need a class named point. I'm, I'm gonna edit this document right now so it says point. An array list of point objects and a two-dimensional array of ints to hold your data. So we need those things in the end to make those the different classes that way? Yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Um, the, the book shows plenty of examples of making classes, just not this particular one. All right, let's make the revisions. Everywhere the word. So point class with x, y values for the coordinates or the rows and columns and a z value for the data. We'll create random point objects. And each point created will be added to the array list of point objects. And then the for loop will go through the array list of points and increment or will set an element in the 2D array. OK. 
Okay, what am I messing up? Yeah, thanks. Well, at each point, thank you. <laughs> so, point this dot add. <laughs> there, like that. Yeah. Okay. So, what data structures do we need? We want that class named point, an array list of point objects, and a two dimensional array, which we could call map. Here's our example point class. Why didn't I just do a search and replace? I don't know. Okay, <laughs> there we go. And there's our 2D array called map. This one is just 10 by 10. Here's an array, an example of an array list of point objects. Array list point, point list, and then point list is equal to new array list. You can re-specify the type here if you want it, but you don't have to. You can leave that blank. So we populate the array list with point objects with randomly generated x and y values, x and y and z values. We move the data from the array list to the 2D, setting that element at that map position. starting point for this is shown on page three and then print out the 2d array oh gosh there it is point so we're a point list number of points I'm just going to call it num and the map size x 10 20 40 whatever the number of points. Then we're going to generate that many random number of points. And so P of X is a random value between 0 and the map size X minus 1. So if we set it to 40, it would be 0 and 39. P dot Y is equal to a random value between 0 and map size Y 1. And then P Z is equal to a random value between 1 and 9. And then we add that to our point list. Then we move the data from the array list to the 2D array. So we make our 2D array using that syntax. And then for every point in the point list, the row or the x coordinate, the column or the y coordinate, and the data or the z column. Let's change that to match what we were doing in the video earlier. There we go. And now set each element at position row, comma, column to Z. And then print out the 2D array. So here's a two-dimensional, excuse me, a doubly nested loop. One loop inside of the other with rows and columns. Let's go ahead and declare our variables as we go. And there we go. So that is the vast majority of the assignment. Oh no. Let me Google. Let me just do a search for the word pair. No matches. Yay, we got them all. Okay. All right, now this is a good document. So that is assignment three, but we are also going to publish an alternate assignment three. So let's go take a look at that one.
and you can do either one assignment or the other. Or if you want extra credit, you can do both. I heard some eyes rolling at that. Let's, uh, let's take a look. Okay, here's the rainfall assignment. This assignment uses a two-dimensional array. We will use a two-dimensional array, a multi-dimensional array, to track rainfall over three years on a quarterly basis, winter, spring, summer, and fall. We will allow the user to enter the rainfall data for each quarter. One idea is shown below. That's, we'll get to that possible sample run. Then we will display a table with all the data elements. A possible example of that is shown below. And so when we display it, it'll be rainfall on a quarter by quarter basis. Then we will display the average per year. So since we have three years and four quarters, we will need a four by three array or three by four, depending on what you decide is your row and your column. I like using my rows to be the years, so I would make a three by four array. So we have three rows, year one, year two, year three, and then we have four columns. So possible sample run. Now entering data for year one. Then we ask for winter, spring, summer, and fall. Now enter data for year two. And we ask for spring, summer, winter, and fall. Now enter data for year three. Ask for winter, spring, summer, fall. Here is the rainfall data in table form. This is what kind of output we want. Cute little table where it says year one, year two, year three. And then it has the column designations. And then it prints the data out like that. And here are the averages. That should be the last thing it prints. So if we're going to work on this problem, we need to decide. Let's just make a new. We want to declare our array. Then we want our loops to enter the data. Then we want to print the table. And then we want to print the averages. We know how to declare an array. Ant rainfall, but it's in a double array, so we need to do that. Is equal to new ant. It's a three by four array. Now there's more than one way we could code this loop business in order to get this to work. How to ask for the data. One problem when you do these kind of data entries is that in the computer we're counting 0, 1, and 2, but the user wants to see 1, 2, and 3. So anyways, let's just declare a variable called year. We'll make it 0, but we'll add 1 to it whenever we display it for the user. And then while the year is less than 3, because we're going for 3 years, we would print a message out, system.out.println, entering data for year, plus that year, but add one to it, so that it'll actually say year one, year two, and year three. Why are you giving me grief? Oh, because I don't have a... And then do we want another loop, an inner loop that'll ask for winter, spring, summer, fall, or do we just want to ask for four pieces of data? Asking for four pieces of data is the easiest way, but we could make an array of seasons. That being said, that would make it remarkably easy to loop through it, but I'm not going to loop through it. I'm just going to do it just a really clumsy way. So system.out.println, enter rainfall for, and then for which season? Well, the first season is season zero. And then we would get our input. Double, oh wait, if we're entering them as ints, did I? 
make a decision on whether these were supposed to be ants or doubles. I don't remember if I did. Okay. So that should have been a double. That should have been a double. And that should have been a double. I'm going to initialize it to zero, but then we would ask the user. Or we would let the user type it in, you know. Rainfall is equal to, you know, input dot next double, whatever. Now my array and my variable have the same name. Rain this quarter. There we go. And then we would put that into the array. So rainfall at year, and which quarter was this? This was quarter zero is equal to the rain this quarter. We really should put this in a loop rather than, than copy and paste what I'm going to do here. So let's declare our variable here. Then we would ask them to enter it. We would read it in. I just haven't created a scanner, so that's why I've left this commented out. And then we would store it in the array. Then we would want to do it for the next season. System dot out dot print line. Enter rainfall four plus seasons one. You can see why a loop would be useful here. And then rain. Then we would want to get the rain with our next double. And we would want to set rainfall at this year for the next season, equal to rain this quarter. And we could do that two more times. And then since we're inside a loop, we'd want to increment our gear counter. Okay, then the met's a matter of printing the table, which is a 2D printing problem, which we won't demonstrate since we've already demonstrated that already. And then printing the averages. Well, how do you get the average of a two-dimensional array on a row-by-row -row basis? We just have to pull in that row, and then you could calculate the average. We could use a for-each loop, or we could use that four-column row style that we have been doing. I almost want to do four each. But I don't want to make, you know, maybe we sh maybe we'll demonstrate each one. For each year for each array of ants rain year in the rainfall array oh because it's a double not an ant we would want to sum them up double sum is equal to zero for each double rain this Quarter, rain this queue in the rain year array. Sum is plus equal to rain this quarter. And then the average is equal to the sum divided by the length of that array. You just call it row. So this is a row in the rainfall array. Okay. 
So since the rainfall array is an array of arrays where each array is a row of doubles, we've written our for each loop like this. For double row in the rainfall array, we declare our sum, we step through that row, adding all those values to the sum, then we calculate the average and we can print it out. And here's where this starts to look ugly, is that we actually wanted to print year one, year two, and year three, but we don't have a counter to do that. So I'm no longer fond of doing it this way, because we don't have a counter. We could add a counter, but let's just do it with a two-dimensional array, um, the nested loops, just like we were doing before. And we'll just comment this out, because that was kind of a toggle comment. All right. So... Back to the old familiar. For int row is equal to zero, row is less than the rainfall dot length. Row plus plus. For int column is equal to zero, column is less than the length of that row, so rainfall at this specific row dot length. And so these are the data elements themselves, so we need to create a sum variable. And then sum is equal to the rainfall at row column. Once you're done with that inner loop, you can calculate the average. Average is equal to sum divided by the length of that array, rainfall row column. misspelled here. Then you could print that out. System.out.println average for year. I'm going to use printf just because I like doing that. Percent %d is percent %f. d for integers, f for floating point types. What year is it? The year is equal to the row in this case, but row plus 1. I don't want it to say year zero, year one, year two. I want it to say year one, year two, year three, and then the average. All right. Let's see if this works. It ought to print a whole bunch of zero averages. Yeah, because we didn't actually do the data entry. But, but that is code for calculating the average per row. Right, we don't have to make a class and we don't have to make an array list of those classes. So, all in all, it's an easier assignment than the other one. But yeah, try both. <laughs> Get the extra credit for doing both. So, last couple of topics I want to hit is just how to average a one-dimensional array or array list, and then the use of a while true loop. I'm going to go ahead and declare a scanner at this point. Now I'm going to make a new project to do this. Okay. We have our scanner declared. Now I want to write something that will allow the input of an indeterminate number of values, meaning we don't know whether the user is going to enter one or a thousand different values. And so the way this is going to work is we want to print a message like enter score or minus one to exit. So let's put this in a loop, but we're instead of having a counter, we're just going to do while true. While true means that the loop iterates over and over and over until a break statement is found. 
the system dot out dot print line enter score or minus one to quit now let's read that in I'm just going to assume that these scores are in now we check our sentinel value is negative one if they enter a negative one we're going to bail out of the loop so if score is equal to negative one that's our sentinel value then exit the loop else do something incredibly important with that score So let's run it. We really don't need this count on here, do we? Okay. Enter score. We type in 100. It does something incredibly important with that score. Enter another score. 90. 80. Negative 1. It quits because it hit the break statement. And the break statement causes it to leave that while loop. So we could make a data entry loop for an array list and store all that data in an array list. So an array list of ints, but it can't be of type int. It has to be of type integer because you can't use primitive data types in your array list. So we're going to use the helper class integer. I'm going to add the import for java.util.arraylist. So now we have two imports up there at the top. And I'm going to call this scores is equal to new array list. Alrighty, so if they don't type in negative one, we want to add that score to the score list. So scores.add there. So system.out.print line score was added to the scores. Now we want to calculate the average. As long as they didn't enter negative one immediately, we have pieces of data. If they did enter negative one immediately, then this is going to generate a divide by zero error. So double sum is equal to zero for each x in the scores list. Sum plus equal x. And then system.out.println average score is plus the sum divided by the length of the scores list scores dot size it's size rather than length when you're dealing with array lists rather than arrays so inner score 180 and then we quit so the average should be minus one excuse me it should be 90 it should be halfway between the two so that's code for stepping through an array list called scores. And that exact same code would step through an array called scores. But when you got down here, it would be scores.length rather than scores.size. So I had somebody ask me yesterday how to work the break statement into the, so that's why I did that. And I know that some people haven't done the, the averages yet. Yeah, we could. Let's do that. Let's put system.out.println done with data entry. Something like that. I have a syntax here. And so now it's going to go ahead and do that. I earned a 10 and then I quit. So the average is 10. If we wanted to repeat the whole thing we could encapsulate this entire shebang inside another while loop. That would be another while true loop. And 
did all of this stuff, and then at the end of that, we would ask them, system.out.println, do you wish to run again? One for yes, zero for no. Something stupid like that. Okay. Then we would ask them. So we're going to do sc.nextint. And then if sc is equal to no, or if ask is equal to no, it's equal to zero, then we break out. Now about the time we start doing that, it would be a better idea to actually encapsulate this code in another method because it's getting, it's getting kind of gnarly looking. So I would actually take everything except for this stuff out here, cut it, and let's call this function, I don't know, do scores, whatever. So now we actually need a do scores, public, static, void, do scores. And it's going to have all that stuff that we just had in it. So inside the do scores is everything that we did have in main. And then down here is just our little loop. Do we have to use a break in this case? No, we could do a, a, a do while loop in this case. I just like the break syntax so much that I tend to use it more than I should. But we could do this. Int ask is equal to 1 while ask is not equal to zero. We ask them for whether we want to repeat. And there, now we've done it, and that's enough. So, oops, that's a while. That's not a do while. That would work as well. Yeah, e either one would work.